Good afternoon. I'm Council Member Elizabeth Crowley, Chair of the Fire and Criminal Justice Services Committee. Thank you for being here today to discuss the important topic of high-rise fires and what New York City can learn from the London high-rise fire tragedy. I'd like to recognize my colleagues who are here today, Council Member Paul Vallone and Council Member Rory Lansman. Today's hearing will focus on high-rise fires in the City of New York. The committee recognizes the need for emergency personnel to be adequately informed equipped and prepared to evacuate individuals from any and all structures, particularly high-rise buildings, given the landscape of our city. This past June, a fatal fire erupted at the Grenfell Tower, a residential building located in London's West End. At the time of the fire, the Grenfell was made up of 129 apartments and rose 24 stories in height. It had been reported and has been reported since that at least 80 individuals perished in that blaze, making it one of London's deadliest fires in the past century. It also left hundreds homeless. It was reported that a combustible synthetic insulation combined with a flammable exterior cladding were thought to have contributed to the rapid spread of the, daily, of the deadly fire. Just as we recently witnessed in London, there is an ever-present possibility that a building will have to be evacuated at a moment's notice under difficult circumstances. It is paramount that our city's high-rise buildings are constructed of proper materials and will allow for safe evacuation of its occupants. We are here today to discuss the overall nature of how the fire department responds to specific structural fires and to take a look at the several areas relating to high-rise fires, such as examining the fire department's general Preparation for high-rise fires, steps the department has taken to prevent tragedies like the London fire, and to discuss new technologies and tactics that may be under consideration to advance the fire department's capacity and operational effectiveness. Lastly, the committee is interested to learn how first responders communicate with residents during high-rise fires and how the department educates the public on safety measures to take in such fires. I'd like to thank the distinguished members of the fire department who are here today to testify. And uh, now uh, our committee council will administer an oath, and then uh, once the oath is taken, uh, we would ask the department to be begin its testimony. Thank you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Okay, good afternoon, Chairman Crowley and all of the council members present. My name is John Sudnick and I am the Chief of Fire Operations in the FDNY. I'm joined this afternoon by Chief Edward Ferry of the Bureau of Fire Prevention. I'm also joined with Wendy Wong from the Department of Buildings and Jim Esposito from the Office of Emergency Management. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today uh, about high-rise fires and what New York City can learn from the Lon London tragedy. A high-rise building is defined as a building with a height greater than 75 feet. We're here to today to discuss the department's approach to fighting fires in high-rise buildings. The large footprint, increased occupant load, and extensive height of these buildings creates operational challenges for fire departments around the world. Given the nature of our building stock here in New York, we are on the forefront of this challenge. Broadly speaking, high-rise fireproof residential buildings require two remote means of egress, which means at least two stairways that are not located near each other. Residential buildings that were constructed or substantially altered after 1999 are required to have sprinkler systems. We know from experience that fires in these types of buildings generally remain confined to the apartment where the fire originated. In most cases, we extinguish the fire by using hose lines that are connected to standpipe outlets on the floor below the fire. Our ladder and squad companies are also equipped with fire curtains and blankets that can be deployed from the apartment above the fire during wind impacted conditions. In cases where the fire is located on an upper floor of a building, firefighters use elevators to reach the floor of operation. Elevators are, critical, are a critical logistical component in transporting firefighters and equipment to upper floors. The use of elevators increases the speed and efficiency of the operation. 
We also designate at least one uncontaminated stairway for the purpose of evacuating occupants should that become necessary. We call this the evacuation stair. Since the interior attack on a fire is conducted using a standpipe outlet within a stairwell, the area in that stairwell on the floors above the fire can become contaminated with heat and smoke. We refer to that as the attack stair. For this reason, in most cases, occupants are safer if they remain in their apartments until after the fire has been extinguished and the building is cleared of smoke. On June 13th of this year, a fire occurred at a London residential high-rise building known as Grenfell Tower, a 24-story building containing 120 residential apartments. It featured concrete construction, which is generally considered fireproof. Exterior cladding had been installed on the building in May 2016. No sprinkler system was present. The building was centered around a single enclosed stairwell in the core of the building. That was the only means of egress. A fire was reported on the fourth floor of the tower at 12.54 a.m., and the first arriving units from the local fire department were on the scene six minutes later. The department conducted an interior attack on the apartment of origin. However, the fire quickly spread to the floors above via the building's exterior cladding system. Within, within 17 minutes, the fire had spread to the uppermost floors. There are different types of cladding. The specific, the specific type of cladding used at Grenfell would not have been permitted in New York City. The, the material used on the tower consisted of metal composite materials, or MCM. New York has experienced no fire involving MCMs. However, a variant of this type of insulation is external insulation finishing system, or otherwise we refer to it as EFIS, which has some qualities similar to MCM. EFIS is more prevalent with uh, New York City building stock, and we have experienced three documented fires on buildings uh, with EFIS. The department has been aware of EFIS for more than a decade, and it is our regular practice to include the presence of EFIS in building descriptions in our critical information dispatch system, or SIDS. In the wake of the London fire, we took steps internally to review our operational protocols and assess whether changes were appropriate. We launched a task force consisting of members of the Bureau of Fire Prevention and our partners at the Department of Buildings to review buildings with exterior cladding. As part of this task force, DOB pulls permits, building plans, and other paperwork for each high-rise building that has been identified as containing EFIS. Fire department inspectors accompany DOB inspectors and engineers to high-rise buildings. The information gathered during these visits is entered into a database that helps to educate local fire units that respond to the area. This process helps the fire department familiarize ourselves with the unique nature of each building and capture the knowledge that we gain in our SID system. In this way, any unit responding to an emergency at the location will be immediately notified of the presence of EFIS. Another significance of identifying buildings in the city that are outfitted with EFIS is that we are updating tactics that will improve the way that we approach a fire in such a building. We are currently in the process of finalizing new operational orders that would amend firefighting procedures to include the use of exterior streams as an initial offensive attack method when operating at a fire in a building with EFIS exterior walls. We have also reassessed the nature and number of resources that we dispatch for a fire in a building with EFIS. By sending a greater number of apparatus more quickly, we can more aggressively fight fires in a manner that reduces the risk of EFIS or other exterior cladding, syst or other exterior cladding systems becoming a factor in accelerating the fire. Roughly a week and a half after Grenfell fire, we sent a team of FDNY personnel to London to review the incident in person. The team spent time with members of the London Fire Brigade, including firefighters who responded to the Tower fire. Our members visited the site of the incident with London Fire Brigade investigators. After that trip, we were able to introduce our contacts at Underwriters Laboratory, UL, to Martin Tucker, the lead investigator of the Grenfell Tower investigation. The London Brigade subsequently requested UL's assistance in their investigation of the incident and product, and product testing. We expect that this assistance will prove useful not only to the Grenfell Tower investigation, but will also pay dividends by improving the accuracy of building and construction standards. 
improving such standards issued by UL and other international bodies, as well as by domestic standard, standards organizations, such as the National Fire Protection Association, will benefit cities and fire departments around the world. The Grenfell Tower fire was a tragic incident, and our hearts, our thoughts, and our prayers go out to the people of London for this devastating loss of life. However, we are determined to use the lessons learned to improve the way we respond to incidents here in New York, and that way, the legacy of Grenfell will be that the lives will be, the lives will be saved in the future. I thank the Council for its attention to these important issues. Does that complete the city's uh, administration's testimony today? Yes. Okay, I'm going to let my colleagues ask questions first. If Roy Lanceman has questions. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I like that. The members get to ask questions first. I don't, I'm not sure I'm going to do that with my committee, but I like it very much. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. So I, I want to understand this issue of the um, EIFS. What do you, what, what do you, how do you pronounce it, EFIS? Okay, it's a made up pronunciation. Um, which is similar to the MCMs, which was the cladding at issue in the, the London fire. Um, it's interesting, I, I appreciate the seriousness with which the department is, is, is taking, reviewing what happened in London and trying to uh, figure out how we would deal with fires here in, in New York City. Everything the fire department does is, is very impressive to me and the, the professionalism and, and seriousness in which you um, deal with these issues to, to keep us all safe. But um, I want to understand why it is that, um, whether or not it would be practical to, to, to ban these uh, EFSs, these EIFF, EIFS materials and that type of, of cladding. I understand you're going to do operational changes, you're going to make it possible so that the fire units responding will know that they're dealing with that kind of cladding and you're going to come up with new tactics as to how to, to deal with fires where, where, you, where you have that um, on a building and maybe send more trucks out and, 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 and changing the way that you do things in a substantial way to deal with this different kind of a potential threat, but educate me. Is is it simply impractical or impossible for some reason to say that this kind of material, which was so tragic and and which played such an important role in, in in the devastating fire in in London, could not be simply simply banned or or prohibited from use? My understanding from the testimony is that from start to finish, by the time it was only 17 minutes before the the, the London tower was engulfed in flames. So all of the, 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 the smart ways you're coming up with dealing with that, that problem I mean, is probably uh, going to have minimal effect or, or, or going to be seriously limited by the fact that these fires happen so quickly. So that's a long way of, of framing the question. Why, why can't we just ban this kind of material? Okay. Uh, well, the First, let's begin by saying that there was a difference between the material used in London and the material that's being used here uh, in the United States and more specifically in New York City. Um, I'll re refer to my colleagues from uh, fire prevention. But, but they're similar enough that, that you're adjusting your tactics and everything to, to, to deal with it, so. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I'd just like to say uh, what we're speaking about is uh, exterior cladding, which surrounds the building. And basically, the exterior cladding is used for uh, insulation or R factor, uh, for aesthetics and design, uh, waterproofing, and drainage. Uh, what we're talking about, really, the, the, uh, the product is the, the plastic that's used to insulate. Uh, there's, there's different levels of plastic. Um, if you think of the plastic as grades of wood, uh, there's different grades of wood. So uh, you have the less expensive wood, like pine, and then you have the more rugged and, and solid wood, like red oak or oak. So uh, what we're looking at here in Grenfell is uh, a type of plastic that was used that is not, you know, you can't use that in New York City. Uh, 
to further uh, Chief Barrier's comments, um, so the building code does regulate these materials. So there are testing standards that are nationally and internationally recognized. And also not only currently in the New York City building code are these accepted certain uh, materials are of the, certain classes of these materials are accepted materials. There's uh, specific applications in which they can be used for. So what happened in London, they used the wrong material in the wrong application, something that isn't, uh, wouldn't be allowed in New York City's just because our code is written differently than what they had done. Yeah, I'm sorry, there's, there's a disconnect and, and it's very likely that I'm, that I'm not understanding something but there's definitely a disconnect. Much of your testimony is how there's this material that is similar to the material that was used in London. Different, but similar enough that it's creating enough of a concern that you're gonna go through all these different operational changes and studies and, and, and it seems from your testimony that the fire department is very concerned about this material, this EIFS. It's similar enough to what happened in London that it's, you know, five paragraphs of your testimony. So if it's similar enough to what happened in London to cause all of this alarm and concern and all these operational changes, why not just ban that kind of material? Okay, so we, I'll speak about the, the operational changes. Um, you know, we like to think we're being proactive in this sense. Um, the, by definition, the cladding is considered combustible, okay, um, e even, even though it's been treated to reduce its combustibility. So let, me just, let me ask you, is there non-combustible cladding? Could they be clad, is there cladding that's yeah, not? Yeah, concrete and steel is the only thing that's non-combustible. So, um, so we're being proactive, I think, from No, I'm sure department you are. That, the yeah. department is terrific. I'm, I yeah. commend you for being proactive. My question is, if this material is as dangerous as it seems that right. it is, and if it can produce a raging fire like what happened in London, you know, within 17 minutes, even though it's different material, but there's some enough of a similarity that you're making the comparison, is, is it impractical or impossible to ban this kind of material, this kind of cladding outright? Well, I, I think that uh, it requires a conversation with our partners, um, you know, at the national laboratories or uh, underwriters laboratory, NFPA, uh, to do some more research into uh, the type of applications that are being used here in New York City. Certainly, I think that would be um, would be reasonable for us to uh, to, to further those conversations. Um, and the NFPA is actually uh, reviewing the uh, the standard, uh, as I believe, as a result of Grenfell. Uh, they put out a memo on July 17th this year uh, stating as such. So uh, the NFPA will be taking a look at uh, the applications as well. So, um, but the, the, the point of my testimony was that in the FDNY, we, we believe that we have um, uh, more resources, more capability, um, and uh, more training than just about any fire department in the country or in the world. Uh, so we want to be proactive in trying to deal with this if, if, we, were, uh, if we were to encounter a fire uh, involving the material. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And again, kudos and commendations for the seriousness with which you're, you're, you're taking this. It just seems to me, and I acknowledge that I may be missing a lot, that if this material is so inherently dangerous and presents such a tremendous challenge, is, it, is, is there a reasonable way to, to ban this kind of material? There, there may not yeah. be. You know, so it's uh, from our experience, again, in my experience, um, we uh, have uh, two documented cases in, of involving EFIS and one undoc undocumented case uh, or less documented uh, and no documented cases involving MCM. So uh, we're trying to measure our uh, response. Uh, certainly, you know, we, we take what happened in London uh, very seriously. Um, but we want to measure our, our response. And I think that includes having the conversation with the national laboratories and, and you know, our partners over there to, uh, to, to see if they need to, you know, maybe revisit it. Okay. Um, last question, different topic. Uh, our friends in the building trades have 
alerted us to the possibility that there might be plans afoot to change the way um, the, the metal hangers and the black iron uh, arrangement of, 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 uh, in ceilings, the way that um, uh, the, 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 the ceilings are con constructed and, and right now they're done using this black iron. We're gonna have testimony later, I know, from the iron workers. Um, but uh, are you familiar with, with that, that structural issue? And are you aware of any efforts afoot to, um, to change that? I believe you're talking about black iron for the hanging ceilings? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm not familiar with that. I, I just know about the black iron. Okay. Sorry. And I'd just like to add also regarding the EFIS, you said that why all of a sudden did we suddenly begin to act? In, in terms of EFIS, we've known about EFIS for the last 10 years. Uh, like Chief Sudnick says, uh, New York City Fire Department is very proactive. Uh, we saw that this was a possible, you know, operational concern. And what we did is we started recording that on our uh, critical information dispatch system, or SIDS, and this is information that is uh, given to responding units to give them some insight when they respond to the scene of a fire to get some idea of what's going on inside the building. Yeah, again, um, really nothing but commendation and appreciation for your looking at what happened in London and seeing what do we need to, to look out for here in, in New York City. Really nothing but, but, but all good for the fire department question is, and that is a conversation I think we need to have, um, like why is this material even being allowed to be used, if, if there are alternatives, and I don't know that, that there are, so we should have that conversation. That's all I have, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Lansman. Um, in line with Councilmember Lansman's questions, um, the cladding that was uh, used in the London fire and, and cladding that's used on our buildings today, that's mostly for decoration, right? It's, it's not for insulation. Uh, as I said earlier, it's used for a variety of items. It's uh, mm -hmm. uh, insulation, uh, aesthetics, you know, the design, uh, waterproofing and drainage. And uh, just to uh, clarify, what we're talking about is the insulation, the plastic insulation. That's sure. our concern, not what's on the outside of it. In the London fire, was the cladding combustible? The insulation was. So it it's was part of a system. Okay. Okay. So the insulation is more or less, the, like I said earlier, like a like a sugar wafer type of thing, where the insulation's right, right, right. in the middle and it's sandwiched on you know, on either side, either with metal or with uh, you know uh, cement. So it wasn't the type of cladding it that was, was the structural. Uh, decor of the exterior. Well, it was a combination of, of the combustible plastic and then the air in the space. <coughs> there was a, 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 a unobstructed, a concealed space which ran the length of the building, which enabled the fire to uh, to burn unobstructed. So, it, it's both both could be a problem in building materials: the insulation and the cladding. Just the insulation. Just the insulation. Yeah, the cement on the outside of EFIS is not going to burn, and the, the aluminum on the, the outside of MCM is not going to so burn. And so the exterior wasn't plastic, a combustible type of plastic. The, well, the inside, part of the system, the, the, the assembly, the, the exterior cladding. I'm trying to explain it to you. It, it, it's, it, uh, so it, MCM is a sandwich panel. It's about a quarter inch thick. There's two sheets of aluminum on the outside with a... Uh, foam plastic in the middle, so it's a thin layer of foam that keeps the metal straight so that it looks better than uh, what in, without. So it's twofold. It provides a cladding and an insulation. Can you see that metal from the outside when looking up at the building? Uh, so for MCM, yes, it's uh, MCM doesn't offer a lot of uh, insulation value. Um, in the case of London, they had uh, the MCM sandwich panel on the outside a two inch air gap and then more foam insulation and then the existing building wall. So it was compounded by flammable foam, flammable uh, non-fire rated uh, MCM panel. Um, so we would not let building materials be used in New York City that were, weren't fire rated. Uh, that's correct. That our current building code and even going back further in previous codes would not have allowed th that material for this application in the high rise. Have we had experiences where cladding and insulation uh, 
helped the fire grow, like, you know, didn't protect and, and was acting as something like this uh, insulation and cladding in London that uh, caused for, uh, you know, a greater disbursement of the, the flames. Yeah, we have not experienced an MCM fire uh, that's been documented uh, in, in, in AFDNY uh, to, to date. So, so something different from New York City and London, where we don't, now we could rest assured that our buildings in high-rises, uh, materials that are used in high-rises are not combustible. Is that what the buildings department is saying and the, the fire department? Not that it's non-combustible, it's that if you use combustible materials, it complies with the code requirements, which also references national testing standards. So manufacturers have to perform the tests for the whole assembly and confirm that they pass these tests. So it has to pass a level of combustibility. And if it uh, is proven to be safe, then it could be used in our buildings. Can we rest assured that our products used to build in New York are safe? I think what Wendy is saying is that the, uh, the materials that are used in New York City are in compliance with national standards and they're currently in our building code. So they meet that code. But we do have situations in our building code where we have standards that are higher than national standards, correct? Yes. Could this be a situation where we would look to have a standard that is higher? We are in contact with the testing committees to do these tests and also with the International Code Council to see where they're going with it so that we're keeping up with the, whatever the standards are developing and we're certainly reaching out to get our input in there too. And just for further clarification, has there been any fire that has happened in recent years, any high-rise fire where the cladding or the insulation cause for the fire to grow rapidly and spread the fire rather than uh, being non-combustible and, and more like concrete and, and contain the fire? Uh, not, in, not in New York City involving MCM. And uh, regard, involving EFIS, not in New York City either. So the answer is no. It has not happened in New York City. None that we have documented. Another a difference in New York City, as you said in your, your testimony, We just wanted to make sure and clarify that there's no cladding that uh, has been considered part of the reason for a fire growing quickly. Okay, so. Whether it's that material or some okay, other. Okay, so it, uh, maybe it'd be helpful if I could just um, uh, speak briefly about the, the two, two of the documented fires that we experienced involving EFIS, which is uh, a, a type of cladding. Um, they were on uh, low rise buildings. Um, one was in 2008 in Queens, involving a, um, a commercial building, and um, the other one was uh, uh, more recent in 2012 uh, in, in the Bronx. And um, so th 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 those are documented and where we did experience some flame spread on, uh, as a result of the EFIS material. Um, so yeah, th th that... But that building material is still allowed to be used today? Correct. But, but not on high rises? No, uh, it, it, it is installed on high rises to a limited extent, and uh, I think Wendy could expound on that a little bit. Um, to the, where the material itself, and where it's tested in its assembly, where it's proposed, it's not just the insulation, but with the backup, uh, with the finished coat, when the material and its assembly is tested and approved, that it is allowed to be used. But we've, we've had situations with low-rise fires that this material has uh, been combustible and has caused for a greater uh, tragedy or disaster or a greater fire altogether because it's so, – so if the city knows this, then why are we still allowing that material to be used? Uh, it, it's a widely used material stemming from the 70s, so we are definitely uh, reaching out to the testing committees and the international code councils and other jurisdictions to see – how they're handling this and also putting in our input for future code updates. It seems like the, the material is not ideal.
Well, I think it, the material serves the purpose that it was designed to, uh, from a building perspective. Um, I, it's not designed to be a, um, you know, to provide fire protection, if, if that's what you're referring to. Right, but if you're fighting a fire, you'd rather the building not have that material if it could make the fire more dangerous. Well, if I, I would prefer that every building be sprinkling made of concrete as well, but... Uh, okay, we, let's, we, let's get into that. Okay. Um, so, sprinklers were only made law. It seems, in your testimony, you said 1990? Was it 1999? Because the, for a lot of residential buildings, it, it was, I thought, in 1970. No? I think the first uh, requirements for sprinkling did come up in the 70s. Yeah. The first time it, it became part of the building code? Uh, in the building code, as the Chief Sunday referenced, that for all high-rise buildings, it was 1999 that uh, that amendment was made to the uh, building code. Wow. So this London building was a public housing type building. So, Chief, in your testimony, you mentioned that in any of our high-rise buildings, we have more than one means of egress. There was a problem with this building. It only had one staircase. At what point in, uh, and maybe it's the Department of Buildings knows the answer to this, how many uh, means of egress need to be put in uh, high-rise buildings? And how do, how do you determine if it's more than two so since uh, even from the 1916 building code, we've always wanted two remote access, uh, two remote means of egress from every story of every building. So it, it would seem highly unlikely that there would be a high-rise building without two means of egress at the very least. Um, the current 2014 code also, uh, for certain high-rises of uh, I think 420 feet high, also require a third stairway um, so to accommodate the number of occupants coming down. So it goes by height rather than a number of units? No, it does also uh, based on number of occupants to, for lower floors, but there's an immediate mandate at the 420. Now, are you aware that there was a recent uh, article reporting how NYCHA isn't uh, fireproof? Uh, most, we have like over 400,000 people in our city living in New York City public housing. And um, does the fire department know if uh, any housing units have sprinklers in them, New York City housing units? I, I would, I don't know. Uh, I, I can't say with certainty that none of them are sprinklered, but I would, um, I, I think it's safe to assume that if the building was built before 1999, that they would not be uh, protected with sprinklers. Right. So the fire department checks, resi uh, it checks buildings that are office buildings, and they make that every office high-rise building have some type of evacuation plan, correct? But the same is not true for residential buildings. Is that right? There's no standard of one of the reasons... So, well, uh, uh, hotels, one, hotels are excluded, I believe, and I'll defer to Chief Area, but um, a high-rise hotel is a residential building that would require an evacuation plan, but um, high-rise office buildings are um, generally more transient, um, and I, I assume that's, that's why it, uh, it became part of the, uh, the code, um, to have an evacuation plan in an office building as opposed to a residential building. Does the fire department have concern about the lack of planning in place in residential buildings? In uh, understanding some of the things that happened with the London fire, uh, many of the people who were in the buildings, they were frustrated from reports. Um, those who got out said that they didn't feel like there was ways um, their fire department or emergency personnel was communicating with them. So there, there was no plan in place prior to this fire, and then while the fire was happening, there was no way of communicating. How would the fire department look at working with residential buildings to uh, make sure there's a better plan in place 
got, but a situation like this was to happen when there was a high-rise fire for evacuation. And um, how do you communicate with people while this is going on? Okay, so um, I think the best way in, in those, um, those types of buildings that don't have communication systems is to be proactive, in which we are, with fire safety education. Um, you know, our guidance for, uh, for high-rise fireproof dwellings, and I, I mentioned it before, um, is, is to uh, have the people, if, if the fire is not in their apartment, to, to shelter in place in their apartment. Um, that's, that's the best way with, all, with the large number of buildings that we have in this city, um, high-rise residential buildings, is to educate the public. Uh, we have information on our websites. Um, we have a fire safety, fire safety education unit that will go out um, to, um, especially after serious fires and, and high-rise residential buildings, will go out and provide that information to those building residents. Um, the newer buildings, um, there, there is a requirement uh, to have a communication system, and, and that certainly helps. We, we'd be able to answer questions right there on the scene, um, but they're not in every building. And there are uh, alarms in residential buildings that communicate to, would say, stay in your unit? Or? Uh, to to your, uh, your question, uh, I believe in buildings over 120 feet, residential buildings over 120 feet, there's a uh, one-way communication from the lobby, which is at the uh, fire command station, to the intercom inside the apartment. And you could also, from the fire command station, make announcements uh, in the in interior stairs, in closed stairs. Uh, and to your, your question regarding the, um, the fire safety evacuation plan, you were talking about residential buildings. The code makes a distinction between uh, you know, transient buildings, like office buildings, uh, as opposed to residential buildings. Uh, people who live in residential buildings have a very common knowledge of, uh, of what's going on in their building. They know where the stairs are, the elevator, the compactor. They know how to get into the backyard, the park, the parking garage. You know, if there's a doorman, they know them. They know where the stores are. I mean, they're very familiar with the building and its location. And uh, in the event of an emergency, they don't require a plan. However, we do have some sort of uh, what we call a, a fire safety guides and notices which is uh, distributed by the, the building owners to the uh, occupants of the apartments, which indicates to them, you know, in case of fire, what you should do, who you should call. Uh, I think we advocate calling 911, you know, it points out to the stairs and some of the information that Chief Sudnick was speaking about before, stay in your apartment unless the fire is in your apartment, keep your doors closed, and so on. Does the fire department inspect NYCHA buildings? Yes. And um, do you know how many of them are considered uh, more combustible or combustible? I don't have the exact numbers, but uh, most of the NYCHA buildings that I've seen are uh, non-combustible. Are not combustible? Non-combustible. There's a report that says that there's 40% None of them have sprinkler systems, as far as we know. Or sorry, not 40%, one in four, so that would be 25% combustible. Well, I also want to add, too, that uh, NYCHA is the biggest landlord, I think, in New York City. So when you said NYCHA buildings, I'm thinking of project-type buildings. You know, they could also own other buildings, which I'm not familiar with. Is there uh, more uh, education and safety um, outreach that's provided in those that are considered more dangerous or more combustible? Uh, we're not aware of uh, the report, but um, we'd like to take a look at it to, to right. see what buildings they're referring to. But it seems that if uh, the city is only put in our building code the need for sprinkler systems, most buildings uh, that house people today, that whether they're NYCHA or uh, high-rise residential, are not equipped with uh, that type of sprinkler system that would better contain and help towards uh, fire suppression. 
Um, I'm, I'm just trying to, if you could rephrase the question uh, again. Is that a question or is how many? How many, do, does the fire department know how many units in the oh. city in high rise buildings are protected with fire sprinklers? Uh, I don't think we have an exact number on the amount, but I know any building, we could refer to the date uh, that they were required. So, you know, it's safe to assume from our purposes, anything, any building that was constructed after 1999 or substantially altered would have sprinkler systems. Those predating that would not. Uh, that doesn't mean that there wouldn't be some buildings that predated that that uh, had them installed, um, uh, uh, you know, I guess in excess of the code. Uh, so uh, I, I don't believe we have an exact number or a percentage, but perhaps we could work with DOB to get that number for you. Does the fire department have different protocols for people who have special needs and they're trapped in the building? Uh, we, we don't have uh, special protocols per se. Um, again, we use our critical information dispatch system to, if we had that information uh, ahead of time, we would include, we have a, a provision to include that in our uh, SIDS information that would direct us to uh, handicapped uh, people, uh, physically handicapped people in, in, um, in any type of building. And also uh, building code provides for that? Uh, for uh, safety spots, safety areas for people with disabilities in staircases or uh, uh, but, but it's in, I, I believe, in the building code under accessibility, Chapter 11. So uh, when the fire department inspects NYCHA buildings, do you go into units? No, and, and uh, any residential uh, building, uh, uh, whether it's a private dwelling or a uh, multiple dwelling, the fire department does not expect um, individual dwelling units. Do we have an idea of whether a uh, fire is more likely to happen in a NYCHA building as or compared to just other buildings in general? Uh, we don't keep uh, statistics um, uh, from one as opposed to another. We, you know, we can give you a number of uh, high-rise residential fires and uh, like uh, average uh, annual average, uh, but not a distinction between NYCHA and any others. Just because I uh, understand that there was a Department of Investigations audit that the city found that out of 188 NYCHA apartments, 106 of them checked out that not be having uh, working smoke uh, detectors. And it seems that um, although we're making sure other landlords in the city follow the rules, that our own housing authority is not making sure that tenants in NYCHA buildings are safe. And that's why I would think that we probably have any, and more fires in public housing than in uh, other housing facilities because we're really not holding our landlords more accountable. Yeah, I understood, and, and, and the concerns uh, certainly we advocate for, and um, a smoke, you know, that landlords, all landlords, including NYCHA, uh, install and maintain uh, smoke detectors in their units. Uh, that, that's the best way, um, you know, We'll work with NYCHA to ensure that they have enough uh, uh, smoke detectors in, uh, in their dwelling units to make sure that they're, you know, they're properly protected. That's good. I, I have no further questions. I want to thank the uh, panel for being here today to testify. I thank you for the work that you do in helping keep New Yorkers safe. I'm interested in hearing from the public who is, uh, people have signed up to testify. I, of course, I would like to make sure that uh, the administration, both the fire department and Department of Buildings, has somebody on hand to hear the, the testimony of the public. Uh, so, that, so thank you again for being here. No, no questions. Thank We've you. been joined by my colleague, Matthew Eugene, who is here uh, shortly, but should be coming back. 
Next up, we have uh, John Skinner from the Iron Workers, Local 46. Melissa Barbara from New York Fire Sprinkler Council. For the record, we have uh, testimony submitted from uh, the Steam Fetters Local Union 638 of the United Association of Steam Fitters and uh, Pipe Fitters. And we also have testimony submitted from the National Fire Sprinkler Association. Uh, Mr. Skinner, when you're ready, please. If we can have quiet in the chambers. Uh, good afternoon, members of city council, chairwoman of the committee. Uh, my name is John Skinner. I'm the president for Local 46 Iron Workers. We represent about 1,700 workers in New York City that work on unionized construction sites in the city. And I'm here to just bring up the issue of the black iron, or Appendix R in the building code which the black iron is part of. The black iron is a suspended ceiling system that holds the ceiling in place longer when firefighters are trying to evacuate people from a burning building. Um, <clears throat> it keeps our brave firefighters safe in the event of a fire, holds the ceiling up longer. It provides hundreds of middle-class jobs for our members, and under no circumstances should this be removed from the code. Um, the runaway addiction to money from some of our city's wealthiest developers and real estate people should not be the only thing that dictates what we do in New York City as far as building code. Although this is not building code in a lot of other places, I have attached to my testimony some excerpts from Chief, Chief Vincent Dunn's book, The Collapse of Burning Buildings, the second edition. It explains how important this item is in holding the fire, holding the ceiling up in, in the case of a fire. On page 172 and 173, it explains how um, black iron does that. There are also documented cases where ceiling systems that are hung by a direct wire system, which has come up before in the building code review and has been tried to be changed prior to this, Local 46 and the fire department has worked on this together in the past to keep black iron a part of this uh, building code. Um, where there was documentation of two firefighters who were actually trapped by these wires when a whole, a whole ceiling collapsed. These wires wrapped around them, and they had snips in their hands trying to escape and died from smoke inhalation. So I'm here to just bring this to the attention of the city council members, the Department of Buildings, and I believe that the building code is coming up for review again, and in a hearing like this where we're talking about high-rise burning buildings, this is a crucial issue, and it saves lives aside the fact from providing good middle-class jobs, which we seem to be losing at an awful rapid pace these days. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, having this iron system in place to hold up the ceiling is already part of the building code? That is correct. Well, why was it a situation where you had uh, firefighters get trapped? Uh, uh, this was not in New York City. This was in another area where they have the other system holding up the ceilings. Okay. So that's a direct wire hung system, which is um, what happens with the direct wire system as opposed to the black iron system that we install here is the whole ceiling system fails at the arch where all the heat moves up to, so it, it creates all the connection points fail at the same time and the ceiling collapses. Even in the instance where a uh, black iron ceiling starts to fall or fail, it falls in small pieces and never the whole system all at once, and that's because of the way we attach to the arch. 
And this is in high-rise buildings? This is in high-rise residential and commercial buildings, and generally where you have drop ceilings in these buildings. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for your testimony. It seems important that we keep this in part of the, the building code. And, uh, you know, we appreciate your, your time here and testimony. Thank you for your time. Hi. Good afternoon, Chair Crowley. Um, I, my name is Melissa Barber, and I'm with the New York Fire Sprinkler Council, which is a division of the Mechanical Contractors Association of New York. MCA is an organization comprised of 130 members who employ steam fitters local 638. MCA represents licensed contractors that are responsible for the installation, inspection, testing, and maintenance of fire suppression systems in tens of thousands of high density residential, commercial, and industrial buildings, including hospitals, universities, power plants, water treatment facilities across New York City and Long Island. We represent the most competent, informed, and highly skilled contractors in New York City and Long Island, and we regularly provide internal educational seminars and programs for our members that further the life-saving message of the importance of proper fire protection. We're here today to learn in the aftermath of the catastrophic Grenfell Tower Inferno in London. While there are circumstances surrounding the incident that are not entirely parallel, this high-rise fire claimed 80 lives in a building that had no sprinklers, only one staircase, and lacked a fire escape. Many experts agree that modern and properly functioning fire sprinklers could have suppressed the fire within the unit where it began and prevented it from spreading, undoubtedly saving lives. Grenfell Towers expose the inequity of outdated laws that govern fire safety worldwide. Grenfell Towers, a 24-story public housing development, was home to 350 low-income residents. While New York City is further along than many in fire safety, the truth is that fire safety remains one of the starkest examples of inequity in our city. The existing laws protect occupants of newer, more modern, and in many cases, more affluent buildings. In contrast, residents of older, often low-income buildings, remain without adequate protections such as fire sprinklers. This extends to the majority of the 400,000 New Yorkers that reside in NYCHA developments throughout the five boroughs. According to the FDNY's 2012 annual report, there are over 25,000 structural fires throughout the five boroughs, 1,700 of which were categorized as serious. Modern fires grow hotter, more toxic, and burn 800% faster than they did 40 years ago, and fire sprinklers are the first line of defense, controlling 99% of all of these fires. In a report published this past July by the National Fire Protection Association, we see that from 2010 to 2014, the death rate per 1,000 reported fires was 87% lower in properties with fire sprinklers than with properties without. In addition, where sprinklers were present, the flame damage was confined to the room of origin in 97% of fires. The work of our members over the course of recent decades has made a significant contribution to the 75% reduction in civilian fire deaths in New York City from 1973 to 2016. As stated earlier, the city has consistently taken an approach, a progressive approach compared to other jurisdictions. The city made headway over the years, such as Local Law 10, passed in 1999 that mandates all newly constructed multi-family dwellings with three or more units to be fully protected by fire sprinklers. And then we had Local Law 26 in 2004, requiring all commercial buildings 100 feet or taller that did not have to comply with Local Law 5 of 1973 to be retroactively equipped with fire sprinklers. The truth is, however, many of these laws are enacted after a tragedy occurred. There's still much work to be done to avoid continuing that trend. We know that fire sprinklers save lives and that no one should be denied that protection. And what is safe for a building constructed in 2017 should be safe, this is safe for a building built in 1950. And the regulations should cover residents in both cases. The city has made a tremendous commitment to reducing traffic fatalities through the Vision Zero initiative. And perhaps we need a Vision Zero program for fire safety because one preventable death from fire is too many. As I mentioned before, we applaud the city for enacting significant fire safety legislation that has saved countless lives. New York has had its fair share of fire tragedy, from the Triangle Factory shirtwaist fire to only 10 years ago when the Deutsche Bank fire occurred down the block from where we're sitting now. It's important we learn from these incidents. We cannot wait for tragedy to strike before we act again, and we can and must do more to ensure equity and justice for our fire safety policies. 
thank you for your time today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you for your testimony, and I, I like that you're pushing the city to have a zero policy for uh, fire fatalities. Uh, I imagine that you think we should maybe consider a law to retrofit all existing buildings that don't have sprinkler systems. I think that would be great. <laughs> I mean, I, <laughs> I think that would, you know, that would definitely would, protect everyone living in this, this city, and I think the... I mean, it's not funny. It's just expensive, and you're going to yes. have a lot of resistance because landlords are not going to want to have to fit the bill, especially a landlord like NYCHA, which has 400,000 residents. Correct. Well, what do you think it would cost for NYCHA to put sprinkler systems in all their high rises? <laughs> I, re I really don't know. I think that it would have to be looked at probably in a, an approach similar to Local Law 26 of 2004, which gave a 15-year um, window for compliance where when certain work was done, you know, which is coming into right now, we'll have to, by 2019, any of commercial building that did not have sprinklers that was over 100 feet in height would have to have them. I think you'd have to look at a strategy like that. No, I agree. Like, um, when you're putting in a significant investment in a building, just take that extra step. Mm -hmm. And especially in a building where people are sleeping, because uh, I believe that's when uh, you're less likely to be aware that a fire has started when you're sleeping than when you're awake, as you would be in an office building. But either case, both are important to be safe, as safe as possible. And so um, I appreciate you taking the time uh, for being here today, and I appreciate the work of your industry. Thank you very much. I have no further questions. I'm going to call up our next panel of what I think is uh, tenant association leaders, uh, Maria Forbes from Clay Avenue Tenants Association, and Audrey Henry from Finlay Avenue Tenants Association. It's on. Good morning, my name is Maria Forbes. I'm a TA president from Claremont Consolidated, which has seven tenant association presidents. I am for Clay Avenue Tenants Association. Um, I would like to say to you, thank you for holding this hearing because it was a much needed hearing to discuss the safety of public housing residents as well. Um, I did a interview with a reporter from the chief and we went over a lot of issues that were concerned here as well. Some of the sprinklers were included in Claremont Consolidated. There's, I said seven ten association presidents, so there are seven different sections. So my sections, I just happened to ask Ms. Henry, does she have water sprinklers in her apartment buildings, and she indicated no. However, some, my, some of my duplex apartment buildings do have it, and they opened up in around 1985. Other parts of it does not have the sprinkler system. Um, the colds and the materials that the fire departments, it's a shame that the fire departments don't know that we are combustible. We have signs that are adhesive to the back of our doors that indicate that our apartments are combustible. So there is no material in there to protect the residents. Initially, when the buildings opened, there was a full fire alarm system that was installed in the building where we had the switch to and the bell that would alert the tenants that there was a fire. There's only one fire hydrant on my location between 168 and 169 in Clay Avenue. So we had some form of a fire alarm system. That was vandalized through the crack epidemic and it had never been addressed or replaced. But with from 2014, I wanna say, till just this year, we had fire watchers sitting in our buildings due to a fire violation that had not been addressed by NYCHA. And just recently, the fire watcher was removed, so I'm assuming that it was addressed. However, have we been given proper education or training in regards to knowing what to do for evacuation? 
um, with the duplex apartments, some of them have the second egress, some of them don't have the second egress. Um, apartments, some apartments were built with a fire escape, others weren't because they weren't on the first floor. Some basement apartments, they have the fire escape egress to the back of the building, but there's a bedroom to the front of the building with no egress. So if they get caught because the kitchen is in the middle of the apartment and that blows up, that tenant is trapped in that bedroom and cannot get out. Now those apartments were taken off the rent roll. Guess what? They put them back on the rent roll because they felt that they were having such a deficit, but they didn't take a look at the lives of who would be affected by being placed in those basement apartments. And it's basement apartments throughout Claremont Consolidation. It's 750 units located there, over 28 buildings located there. Um, I'm for the young lady's statement in equipping all of the buildings that are combustible with the water sprinkler system. Um, Can you just uh, clarify what uh, you believe to mean when you say combustible? Are they non-brick buildings, non cronk Right, we're sheetrock. We're sheetrock okay. with no installation, um, no protection whatsoever. We know this, but I want to add for the record is that NYCHA is doing the next generation. Are those developers being required to follow these new fire safety laws? There's also a program called RAD, which is the rental assistance demonstration program, new developers are gonna come in, supposedly rehab the building or rehab the apartment. I'm looking for a total rehab. The buildings have not been addressed due, due to NYCHA's deficit since 1985. And if this fire issue that happened in London is such an overwhelming, dangerous situation to put low income, like you said, I clearly understood everything you said, only modernized building, upper wealth, wealthier buildings are established with certain things to protect, but they're not looking to protect low income residents at the cost that it would be. It should be a law that should be put in place that should protect everyone. Everyone is equal. Don't we have that, you know, by race, creed, color, disability, whatever. Everybody should be protected. I'll give you an example. We had a fire last year where a tenant set the apartment on fire on the third floor. It affected the tenant on the fourth floor, which was in a duplex apartment. However, we had a handicapped resident who lived on the first floor in a wheelchair that if it wasn't for Con Edison out there digging up the street, that when the windows blew out, Con Edison immediately, and a NYCHA worker immediately ran into the building to save, and they didn't know, but they knocked on the doors. You understand me what I'm saying? That they knocked on the doors and they was able to bring um, that lady out. One question about the fire hydrant on your block. Is it still broken or has it been fixed? Yes, they repaired the apartment. They repaired the apartment, but we, the egressing is that we have fire escapes to the front and to the back, but there's only one stair hole. Mm. There's only one stair hole. So that's not very good for public housing to my development. We don't have that. It's the two egress because you have the fire escape, but you have the stair hole. But if the stair, residents had to go back into the apartment because the hallway was so filled with smoke and stuff that they had to come down the fire escape. Now, I just saw engineers inspecting because as a result of the interview with the press that a police officer was tracing a drug dealer and he had to knock on a tenant's window to say, the fire escape is not sturdy. Could you let me back into your apartment? So. Now they sent out some engineers to see if the fire escapes are, uh, you know, strong enough to hold I'm people. glad you brought that up. That's very important. Yes. That, you thank know. you for being here. Thank you for your testimony. We have your contact information, and we'll stay in touch. Okay. okay. My name is Audrey Henry. I'm from Finley Avenue. Um, in 1128, the D and the E line, if a fire broke out, they would die if they weren't in their bedrooms because the fire escapes is in the living room and the bedrooms is on the other side of the apartments. So they have no way of getting out in those two lines. And then um, not only that, from the sheetrock 
having no installation and the wood floors up under the so-called tiles running from apartment to apartment, if the wood burns, it's gonna burn throughout the whole building, so the whole building is gonna burn down regardless. And there's no sprinkler systems, and there's no safety nowhere. And the fire is this, is this a, a low rise? How, how many stories is it? I have five. Five stories. in the basement six. And there's one set of stairs? Two sets. And those are inter interior stairs, and you have fire escapes? The fire escape, when you come into the apartment, the living room is to the right and some of, them, some of them to the left. The bedrooms is on the other side, so you have the kitchen right there, which has no window in the kitchen, and they don't have no windows in their kitchens in the E and the D line. They have no kitchen windows in the bathroom. So if a fire break out, they're stuck in them bedrooms because the fire escapes is on the other side of the house. Interesting. And um, so, you're not completely safe in the building, depending on where you are. Right. Is there any other the area? The fire department came and said that they were supposed to put um, safety doors in between the elevators, on both sides of the elevators. Houses said that they weren't done when the buildings were done, so since it has concrete in the hallway, that they're not going to put the safety doors. Do you think by putting a fire escape by the bedroom window, that would... Uh, put the protection needed that currently is in place? Who, who sleeps in the living room? Yes it, yes, it would help, but who sleeps in the living room? When the fire breaks out, they're stuck in their bedrooms because they can't get to the door because the door... But is there a window in the bedroom if there were a fire Yeah, it's the a window, window in the bedroom, but we have, we have gates on them that's drilled in, that's locked. You would have to break out the top window in order to get out. I'd have to see what, what's going on there, but we'll certainly be bringing attention to your units, bringing that to the attention of NYCHA and the fire department, Department of Buildings as well. It doesn't seem safe. Can I just say that the developers, these buildings were not initially for NYCHA. These buildings was for a private developer because we were, the community was given out applications. The contractor fell through or the developer fell through and then they was turned over to HUD to turn over to NYCHA and then everybody got screened and was given the apartments. The apartments are not conventional. So them not being conventional, no, we're not safe. So with even the next generation and the RAD program, it makes it very, unless those things are addressed for new developers to come in, then it's, it's still not going to be safe for us. Okay? No, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, every unit of public housing should be safe. Yes. And uh, anything less is unacceptable. We will stay in touch. Thank you for being here Thank in your Thank testimony. You. Next, we have uh, two representatives, I believe, from the same agency, or I'm going to call the two reps whether they're together or not. Uh, National Ready Mixed Concrete Association, Ten Peng and Brian Medford. Uh, for the record, uh, we're not from the same agency. They're, they're, oh, good. They're, they're, they're. I, I apologize. It's okay. Uh, should Thanks I start? for the clarification. Uh, should I start? Yes. Okay. Um, my name is Tian Peng. I'm a Vice President of Sustainability with the National Ready Mixed Concrete Association. Uh, and I thank the Chair and the New York City Council uh, Committee for the opportunity to comment uh, on the subject. Uh, I reside in uh, Seattle, Washington, but I uh, grew up here in Elmhurst, Queens, went to high school in the Bronx, and got my first degree at Stony Brook. Uh, so my primary uh, background is in architecture, and I uh, would like to speak to you on building codes, uh, a lot of the issues you addressed early on with the fire chief and others, um, fire safety and building materials. Uh, beyond that, I'm not a forensic scientist on the Grenfell fire, nor am I a high-rise 
uh, design expert, uh, so I can make only comments on my observations based on the code. Um, and if it's uh, okay with you, I will go for the testimony as you see there. Does that sound good? But at three minutes, it's good with me. Okay. Uh, okay, um, I'll start by saying that uh, NRMCA uh, is a industry association founded in 1930, um, and we represent an industry with more than uh, 2,200 companies that employ 125,000 American workers who manufacture, deliver uh, ready mix concrete. So you heard concrete as a fireproofing material and fire uh, non combustible material. Um, uh, we represent uh, national and local companies and operate in every congressional district in the United States. Uh, our industry manufactures uh, construction material uh, vital to our built environments, roads, bridges, homes, high rises, and our built environment uh, could not be realized without the use of ready mix concrete. Pretty much any construction project has uh, some ready mix concrete. Um, so uh, I'll start with building codes. And so a lot of the questions you had earlier regarding building codes uh, are relevant um, to my testimony, uh, and I think I just ad want to address the safety issues that you talked about. Uh, safety is to uh, reduce or eliminate some of the risk to people or property, uh, and risk can never be entirely eliminated, uh, and so safety is never absolute, uh, and um, primarily because financial resources, as, as you can imagine, uh, are the most obvious sacrifices um, that uh, is required to decrease risk. So the building code is the law or regulation that's set forth uh, for minimum requirements uh, for the design and construction of buildings and structures. And so um, uh, the, uh, the practicing architect basically takes uh, these regulations, laws, and shapes and organizes his design based on those requirements. And so again, codes are minimum criteria. Uh, and when designing a project, the architect or the owner can choose to go more strict if they choose. Um, uh, so in many cases, a particular code um, uh, that is uh, uh, of paramount importance, uh, like fire, uh, can be enacted into law uh, by the council, for instance. And for instance, New York City's building code established fire limits for the five boroughs. Um, and that means that only specific types of construction, non-combustible, can be allowed within the fire limits, uh, such in the primary structure. So I'm talking about the structure, not the cladding, for instance. Uh, and such restrictions is intended to reduce the configurations of potential of the densely populated area. And your neighbor in Edgewater, New Jersey, is going through the same issues. So um, when an architect, a design professional, looks at uh, a design, he looks at the code by looking at use. What is the purpose of this? Is it assembly, business, residential? Looks at the type of construction, what kind of structural components, uh, and then it takes these uh, into place, and the code tells what's allowable height-wise, area-wise, fire rating-wise, uh, and the number of stories. And so uh, that is how we restrict um, large fires from happening. So uh, I have a section here on cladding. I don't know if you want to hear about that, but cladding is what you heard previously. Um, and the woman who testified before uh, was correct in that in New York City code, in chapter 1407, um, you are not allowed to have the combustible type of that MCM metal uh, composite um, cladding. Okay, thank you. Okay. Good. Yes, I'm Brian Medford. I'm the Northeast Region Manager for a manufacturer that manufactures insulated concrete forms that are being widely used here in the five boroughs, which is a, a component that is made of foam, which you've been hearing about today, and plastic, which is stacked, braced, and filled with reinforced concrete, hence uh, the ready mix. So 
Um, <clears throat> with that, I'm just going to uh, go through my testimony. I will be brief. ICFs is the acronym for Insulated Concrete Forms. I've gained a well-deserved reputation for surviving all types of natural and man-made disasters, including fire. With, with its solid core of steel reinforced concrete sandwiched between two layers of expanded polystyrene foam insulation, they can resist hurricane force winds, fire, earthquakes, explosions, and just the ravages of time, at the same time being very energy efficient. Uh, the, the U.S. military is using ICFs today to construct reserve centers, schools, as well as many other occupied buildings on base uh, due to these disaster resistance qualities. So today, many New York City developers, architects, structural engineers have embraced ICF construction for new construction in multi-use buildings for several things, for their speed, energy efficiency, structural capacity, safety, and sound dampening qualities. There are many examples of these apartment buildings in all boroughs of New York. Um, most examples range from six to eight stories with, a, with one that is 16 stories about to uh, break ground just north of the city in Mount Vernon. Um, <clears throat> ICFs are widely used to construct all building types, including non-combustible type one, two, three, and four. And, and those are based on the type of occupancy, like Tien mentioned, overall height of the building, number of stories, floor area, whether or not the building has sprinklers or not, um, fire rating needed. The building code will classify the building type. The International Building Code allows foam plastics to be used in these non-combustible building types as long as they are fit, as long as the finished wall assembly complies with the National Fire Protection Agency's NFPA 285 test criteria, which is, is mainly a detailing uh, issue, and specific finishes and design details are required to meet these test requirements. The EPS foam also contains a fire retardant and does not support combustion. The completed exterior finish must prevent fire from spreading along the surface or within the core of the building facade. These finishes include traditional cementitious stucco, acrylic stucco, which is the EFIS word you heard earlier, with evaluation, as long as this EFIS has an evaluation report that shows compliance with this test, and brick veneer, of course, which seems to be the most common used with our type of product. Um, the, design, the design focus is on the exterior at the openings to make sure that <clears throat> If a fire is started on a floor and it laps out the window, it cannot migrate up the wall on its surface or within its core. And, th and that's what happened in London. Um, and these systems, these claddings properly installed on insulated concrete forms meet these tests and exceed them. Additionally, the NFP 285 requires non-combustible interior floor systems, not wood systems. It must be a concrete floor. And at each floor, it must break the foam insulation on the inside so that fire cannot migrate up the interior as well. Um, and then the uh, foam must be covered with a half-inch drywall minimum. And then just to finish off, um, not really to do with fire, but in New York City in 2014, there was a massive natural gas explosion that ripped through an East Harlem neighborhood. The blast leveled two apartment buildings, killing eight people and injured 70 others. There was an ICF apartment directly adjacent to the blast that stood strong, did not catch fire. The Bluestone organization here in New York are the apartment building owners directly adjacent um, and were told by the New York Building Department that there was no structural damage at all to their building. The engineer report states that the blast was inches, not feet, from the ICF wall, yet the walls were, were in remarkably good shape and the building did not burn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for your testimony. I have no questions. Last up to testify is Magdalene per Perez.
My name is Magdalene Perez. I am a constituent with Melissa Mark Viverito's office, council speaker. I presented a, to a topic to be heard three, four months ago with council members Elizabeth Crowley and Jermaine Williams, which was approved and scheduled for today to be heard for non-combustible materials, safer housing. On July 3rd, 2017, a dozen people recovering from injuries and several families without a home after a Bronx apartment building went up in flames. The fire started just before noon on 163rd Street in the Melrose section in the Bronx. One police officer cut his hand on broken glass trying to rescue children. People started scrambling down a fire escape and leaping to the ground. Seven civilians were injured seriously. The fire was intense. Witnesses said they saw a fireman come out with a lady in his arms. She was burned really bad, the witness said. There were heroes in the crowd. Alex Pinero, security guard across the street, ran inside, ran inside to save whoever he could. I seen a kid on the third floor screaming for his mom, but I ran upstairs and I grabbed him, put him in my arms. I ran outside, he said, and then I saw a lady. She just fainted right in my arms on the first floor, and I carried her out. People had to knock on neighbors' doors to get everyone out because the fire alarms were not working, residents said. There were no fire alarms that rang, so no one on the fifth floor would have known if no one went knocking on doors. The landlord told CBS2 the fire alarms and sprinklers were working fine. There are fire extinguishers in every apartment, he said. The cause of the fire is under investigation. December 25, 2011, women's daughters Parents, oh, women's daughters and parents killed in Connecticut fire, excuse me. Three children and the parents of a well-known advertising executive were killed when a pre-dawn fire tore through the family Victorian house in a neighborhood overlooking Long Island Sound. Madonna Badger, 47, her screams for help overheard by neighbors who were awakened by the fire. Ms. Badger's three young daughters and her parents died in that blaze. Lily, nine. Grace and Sarah, seven-year-old twins. Ms. Badger shouted repeatedly, my whole life is in that house, as she was led away by firefighters. Ms. Badger's parents, Lamar and Pauline Johnson, who died in the fire, was to celebrate their 49th anniversary. Mr. Lamont Johnson was known prof professionally as Happy Santa, working in the Connecticut Mall. Fire is under investigation, that fire in Connecticut. Matthew Badger, her husband, claims the renovations being done at the home was a fire trap as a result of months of, up, of substandard and dangerous construction. February 9th, 2017, Matthew Badger, who lost his three daughters to the 2011 Christmas Day fire in Connecticut, dies at 51. Matthew Badger maintained his life ended on Christmas Day, 2011 when his three young daughters died in a Connecticut fire. His family said his death was of natural causes. It was sudden and peaceful, said his ex-wife in a Facebook post. He's with his children and family. The estate has settled cases against all the contractors of this fire for more than $8 million according to court records. I am here to introduce insulated concrete forms, the gentleman here um, that just spoke from ICF. 
ICF forms, ICF, uh, insulated concrete forms are home builders. They will construct your home using fireproof materials, fire resistant roofing and siding, fire resistant decking and framing, fire resistant windows and doors, fire resistant insulation and systems, and so much more. They are our future and our present for our children, our families, and neighbors, and our humanity. I give a special thanks to Mr. Mailman, staff member in Elizabeth Crowley's office, for moving forward this topic, and to all involved for bringing this topic to life, for this is what this hearing is all about life, dignity, and respect for people and humanity that want a home and want to live safe in an apartment, a beautiful house, or in public housing. I am a public housing resident. The apartment I live in um, has been in my family for 60 years. There are no sprinklers there in the Red Hook community in public housing. There's one staircase. We do have the alarm, the fire alarms, and the, mo and the um, carbon monoxide. Yes, we, do we have those two. Uh, but that's all we have. The only exit I live on the sixth floor is the front door. So if there's a fire in my house, I'm a goner. There's no way out. There's no fire escape in the Red Hook um, public housing. The only thing I, tell, I told my family, my little girl, she's now 25, she's not with me anymore, she's, you know, Boston. Uh, when we were young, I taught her, we're gonna tie up the sheets. Tie up the sheets real quick, get them wet and tie them up and let's put them out the window. And that is the only way we would have been saved. We are not considered and respected the NYCHA residents, the way we need to be. Respectfully, thank you. Um, thank you, Mrs. Council Perez. Thank you for being here. Women I will uh, make sure that my colleague who chairs the Public Housing Committee knows of uh, the concerns that have been brought to uh, my attention today and through this hearing. And uh, we will uh, make sure that the administration knows our concerns and work together to improve the conditions and to ultimately make our city safer. Thank you, and thank you to, to all who, ha, who came here to testify today. Thank you to the committee staff. This concludes the fire and criminal justice hearing of September 26, 2017. <laughs> Ms. Crowley, thank you very much for hearing us. Okay.